I'll, I'll keep this on the screen. So this is, by the way, the group for MoneraCon conference, which if you didn't join with SimpleX chat, you should join. And you can send the questions there as well, but this conference group, uh, we created it last year when I did a talk here, and I handed it over to the conference organizers. So thanks a lot for having me here. I'm Evgeny. Uh, I am the founder of SimpleX chat. I've done various things in my life, but had some failures, had some open source successes. I won't bore you with the details. We'll dive straight in what I'm going to talk about today. So our plan for today is to talk about what makes messengers private and secure, uh, why the peer-to-peer -peer dream that many developers and enthusiasts cherish, I believe, is completely unfeasible, unsustainable, and pretty much dead on arrival and how we design SimpleX network to try to bridge this gap between communities of privacy and success, which is crazy if we're honest with ourselves, and the rest of the world, which is sane, right? So it's, it's, it's necessary, right? Because if we want to privacy to become a norm, we somehow have to work with normal people who want the law in order to protect them. Uh, Right, so when we talk about security and privacy and messengers, we primarily talk about end-to-end -end encryption uh, and privacy of identity and relations. Uh, I've been criticized a lot for saying that we are trying to redefine what privacy means because everybody knows that privacy means protecting message content, which I strongly disagree with, we'll get to that. And again, security uh, by definition is prevention of the attack. You cannot talk about security if there is no adversary. You can talk about safety, and safety can mean natural causes or unnatural causes, but if you talk about security, you're specifically talking about what adversary can do and how you mitigate it. That's very important, because many people think security is something abstract and it can exist in the absence of adversary. It can't, right? Security requires adversary. So if you think about security in these terms, that end-to-end -end encryption security has multiple attacks. I think I made a talk about that in detail at Fini Forum conference. It's available online. We made a very good blog post about that, and we're about to produce a video about end-to-end -end encryption security, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. I think it's important to understand that end-to-end -end encryption is not just black box. It's a collection of properties that are provided, and these properties will determine which attacks will be feasible and which attacks will be not feasible on your on the security of your content of your messages, right? And all these factors contribute to it. So message size can be attack factor, can be mitigated. Your confidentiality depends on whether non-repudiation is present or not, or repudiation is present as a desirable quality, and whether uh, encryption keys can be broken and there is forward secrecy to mitigate it and uh, break and recovery and then uh, all other things, right? So it's important to understand that many communication solutions focus their communication about the properties of the used algorithms and forget to mention that the whole system compromises many of those qualities. So the fact that some algorithm has certain qualities of end-to-end -end encryption doesn't mean that the system utilizing this algorithm has the same quality. It's very important because uh, the many communication about end-to-end -end encryption security is misled in this way, right? So, not going to point fingers, but this is our comparative analysis, which like people hate me for, uh, because literally none of the messenger does message pads in, other than Kutch. Uh, every single system lost uh, repudiation, at least partially. And they actually even uh, have the, uh, generously gave us green tick, but the green tick will happen only after the next update when they'll include repudiation and the client server connection. Because currently there is a client client repudiation, but there is no client service repudiation. And if the service is malicious, it can reserve the records. So this concept is interesting, but it's not present in any computer. Forward secrecy is present in probably all messengers other than session. Uh, break and recovery is provided by signal algorithm but uh, Signal as a system unfortunately loses it because of the way it does multi-device. Uh, Two-factor key exchange is present when key material is included in the address or one-time link. And post-quantum cryptography is, provides partial protection to Signal and we include it as part of end-to-end -end encryption algorithm. So I think we have 
the world class, the best uh, design for end-to-end -end encryption. They're kicking off the uh, cryptographic design review end of this month. There will be a report on the design of the, these systems, and we'll see what we missed and how we can improve it. Uh, so, interestingly, uh, it's important to remember that end-to-end -end encryption with multiple devices, so that one of the biggest points of criticism of what we do is we don't work across multiple devices as conveniently as other systems do. And what's important to say here, we don't do it for a reason, because all the solutions existing in the industry today to make end-to-end -end encryption across multiple devices work are effectively, to some extent, compromised. So uh, signal algorithm can be made work, but the way it works, people get devices are combined in a group, and it exposes such things as if you use multiple devices on Signal or WhatsApp or any other, I don't know what who else design has the same model, but uh, it means that now your contacts, all of your contacts, can see which device you're messaging from. Do you like it or not? That's your decision. They also can send different messages to different devices. That requires relatively simple client code notification. And operator can't do anything about that because they don't see message content. It's independently encrypted for each device. Uh, so yeah, this is a bit of a problem. Uh, actually, they may mitigate. I actually need to check whether they do mitigate it or not. But WhatsApp doesn't mitigate this attack of being able to send different messages to different devices. Maybe Signal do, does. Right, so yeah, so we're still looking for solutions. Solution does like us to do. So we're going to talk more about privacy of identity and relationships, which we believe is more important because uh, ultimately the way industry tried to redefine privacy is to say, okay, if your uh, content is secure from the attacks, then your communication here is private. It's kind of the further, further truth. So society dictionaries define privacy in terms of having your affairs private, right? And you have to think differently about privacy, security, and anonymity, there's different things, right? So think about this conversation, right? So like, is this meeting private, right? So you can't hear what people say. You can see who meets, how frequently they meet, uh, emotions potentially. So you can observe a lot of secondary data about this conversation without knowing what this conversation is about. And uh, whether it's private or not, it's very contextualized, right? So and do uh, we say like okay, like if you put people in a glass box and let them talk, is it even private? And pretty much any uh, communication network that doesn't protect the identities and connections would operate as privacy in a glass box model. When the operator has full visibility of who talks to whom, how frequently, uh, they have a, an equivalent of digital lip reading by observing message size, and so on. I, I didn't know the term metadata when I started this project, embarrassingly. I, I'm an, I'm a, like, I started as a complete amateur. I've been lucky to find good advisors who tell us that our first prototype is a complete shit. We rebuilt it uh, in terms of many things, right? So it's not, a, it's, it's, it's a bit more distant now, right? So, and when we, I think when we talk about privacy in the way humanity defines privacy, we're really talking about first and foremost metadata privacy. So somehow more narrow definition in the industry matches more wide definition of privacy in a society. We, we wrote a blog post. Uh, we, uh, Astra Al Shafei, who's a long-standing privacy enthusiast who joined our team in April, wrote this blog post that made some circles because it was mentioned in uh, privacy model of WhatsApp. It struck some nerve with some important people, and this issue started to resonate across uh, more uh, mainstream media. Uh, we kind of obviously generously assigned to us this resonance, but maybe it was a complete coincidence. We don't know. So the issue of metadata privacy suddenly got moved into mainstream attention, and when they say that undisclosed WhatsApp vulnerability lets governments see who you miss. It's nonsense, right? It's not a vulnerability. There's a design limitation. Nobody ever promised that operator cannot see who you message. They've been pretty much upfront about this design. So you cannot call conscious design choices a vulnerability, right? Or the next one even talks about some deficiencies of end-to-end -end encryption. But again, they're talking about metadata privacy, trying to explain to normal people what we're talking about. 
So, so again, to make in a similar framework of listing attacks and defenses, uh, we talk about identity and context graph, uh, and we know that most networks rely on user IDs, and that's a problem because even if your identity is pseudonymous, the simple linear regression models will match, uh, and again, you know the term uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, we're talking about linear regression models that have been just put on large computers, uh, but the whole kind of concept of linear regression exists for a couple hundred years, and it's new there, right? If you have two data sets, they can be correlated, and you can now know who's talking to whom, and what are the real names. Just observe Twitter graph, compare it with anonymous graph, you know, who talks. So we, we didn't change uh, this concept. I very much like this image, because it effectively how kind of most communication networks still operate. Okay, they remove the names from the mailbox, put some block on the mailbox, but fundamentally it's a still mailbox attached to a person. Uh, so group participation is also, we were very surprised that people want private groups, or public groups on a private platform, but they want to conceal their participation. Transport identity, we just released what solves it, we'll get to it in a minute. Uh, Correlation by session. I think this is the most misunderstood. When people talk about transport security, they primarily think in terms of IP addresses, but you can understand a lot just by observing sessions. Like there is a huge difference between Tor and Neem because Tor creates sessions, uh, like circuits, and Neem routes packets, which doesn't. It's funny that actually Neem uh, so far found the main application of the packet routes in the network to create circuits. Neem VPN is a circuit created over packet routes on network, which is, which is interesting. I think we're trying to build packet routes in, as an application layer, but the majority of applications don't use packet routes. They use circuits, right? Uh, packet size, obviously, and uh, time, which is the most. So if, again, if we try to put comparative analysis, that's a huge journey for everybody, and most applications don't even try to provide privacy of identity relationships across any of those dimensions. Uh, Kaich uh, is probably doing a good job. We're trying to do as good job as we can, but still a long journey to improve across all those dimensions. We'll be exploring more on that in, in what we write. So I think like the whole motivation for us to build what we build was to uh, resolve problem that, like choice between usability and privacy, right? Lots of somewhat private, not very usable, somewhat usable, not private at all. We still think it's a long journey to privacy. We, we see our mission, uh, think about it, right? I think that we talk about privacy is insane, right? I think I want to live in a world when ordinary people don't know the word or don't talk about it. They know the word, but they don't talk about it. Like, imagine you're going to buy the house and you're asking, I, I actually spent some time in real estate business. So like, imagine you're asking an estate agent, does this house have a toilet? Of course it does. So it's like, is there any house that doesn't have a toilet these days? Right? It's a hygiene factor. You just know there is a toilet. You don't have to ask. There is legal requirements. You can't build a house without a toilet these days. Right? Just try. Right? No, I mean, maybe somewhere in the remote. Like in the city, you can't build a house without the toilets. Right? You have to supply the toilets. It's not because construction companies are generous. If they could get away by building houses without the toilets, they would do that. Right? They simply can't. They're not allowed to do it. Right? <laughs> right? It doesn't matter the price, right? So they have to include toilets into the price of houses. And nobody talks about it, right? And 200 years ago, we had uh, toilets only affordable for the kings and aristocracy, right? There were no. And privacy is pretty much in the same spot today, right? We built lots of houses across the whole technology spectrum, and privacy is not included, and we keep talking about it. And I really see our mission to kill all those conversations about privacy and have all technology solution privacy is included and mandated by law as a hygiene factor. The fact that we talk about privacy when we talk about technology is a huge failure of technology industry. And that's not just messaging, it's every single piece of the stack. CPUs, operating system, every single piece of software, Software distribution, supply chains, internet, everything is broken, right? And an open source is not much better, friends. <clears throat> All right, so this is very important for it to understand. Many say, okay, let's build P2P network and we'll have privacy. This is a lie. This is not going to happen. I'll explain why very quickly. Networks exist because they create value. Because the sum is bigger than the value of individual parts. Because by getting together, we create more value than we consume. So socialist utopia idea is 
that everybody can be a supplier and a provider of value. And if everybody plays fairly, then network can function without any external kind of, or any kind of separation of this then to providers and consumers. So, and it kind of works in a small niche. As a community of enthusiasts, you can operate like this, all these ideas of agorism or barter and whatever, like we have to exchange value between each other and avoid means of exchange and avoid specialization, but it doesn't scale. The problem is, like society achieved what it achieved thanks to specialization, right? We cannot create every single value we need to consume, right? And nobody can be a specialist in everything. So as networks grow, uh, so there are several, like what, what happens as networks evolve? So bigger networks create more value thanks to network effects, right? But as they get bigger, they also attack bad actors and there is nobody to defend this network anymore. Right? You need to whatever, hire some, whatever. You need to figure out what to do. And bad actors either break the security premises, if they or privacy premises, or they disrupt the network function. So think about Tor. Tor security model is based on the idea that uh, like different parties route your traffic, but you can't check if it's different parties or if it's the same. So, so options are only, only four possible outcomes. Stagnation and small niche, introduction of social network authority, as Tor has done, or corruption succeeds, I'm not gonna point any fingers here, or network is split to providers and consumers, which is fa factually happened with BitTorrent, not a design layer, but in how a network happened. Actually, so we believe that the only viable design model is a uh, network of suppliers and consumers of whatever value it tries to create, and that can scale. And network that is designed on P2P principles when all nodes are the same, simply can't scale to, to the world, right? It will stop scaling at about several million people. Uh, so, right, so what we do, we assign identities to connectors between people. So, and obviously connectors, if, in p 3 network, connectors are unclear, so we kind of materialize them into relays that pass messages. The design we did that people receive messages via relays they choose, and send messages via the relays their contacts choose, and obviously this doesn't protect transport information of the senders, so if we accept this factor, we kind of see the network that doesn't know who the users are and how they communicate. So I, I like this analogy. It's almost like for each contact you have, you give safety deposit box to put your messages in, and they give you their safety deposit box, and it's secure, and that kind of works. Collection of dead drops. I showed this picture on the last year in Aircon. Say, okay, we're going to solve this problem by adding second message routing step so that uh, destination relays can't see uh, IP addresses and session information of the senders, we just did it, right? The last version released about a week ago includes this as opt-in, next version will have it by default, so it not only protects IP addresses, but because it's packet routing, it fully protects session information of the senders. So relays cannot correlate messages sent to different connections to the same user because they don't see session information. Again, under the assumption that these two relays don't collude, which is the same with any onion routes and, or package routes in the network. And I don't know if you see this, this is a complex picture. So this is, I don't know why I included this slide. <laughs> uh, but there's a two encryption layers effectively to protect uh, uh, from all possible attacks by, for example, this forward and the relay can't do man in the middle attack on the traffic and it can't see which messages are sent and also destination relay cannot see the session of the connected person, but only can see messages. And it's all, even though it all exists inside CLS, and we put a lot of effort in CLS security, we make all the security guarantees hold even if CLS is compromised. So there is no cipher text in common between two segments of the traffic, and there is no identifiers in common, which is similar to like onion roads. And it's, it's, that's why it's onion roads. So, yeah, I think uh, I look forward to emergence of alternative network that holds this true, and they're trying to make it usable uh, as a normal messenger, which is very hard. And I think we're spot on, on time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much.